turn of the century decadence. Just a little basic human uh, rottenness. <laughs> With a little style, a little, uh, a little soupçon of taste. And uh, perhaps uh, the, the faintest, the faintest suggestion of uh, conviviality, perhaps, is the word I'm looking for. But then, on the other hand, uh, that can be a uh, drag and a pain in the you-know-what. I mean, if it's you that's being put down, just to be calm. It's going to be all right. I'm here. It's all right. Very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, and, uh, of course, here it is. Uh, you know, it's a time to man to mull over his deepest, darkest, stygian black qualities of his lost and gone so you know, all that stuff on Saturday. I got a letter from a guy and he said, uh, says, Shepard, what is this? What are you trying to say? <laughs> That's a good question. And uh, the question, of course, is what is the world trying to say, if anything? It's just there, you know? In fact, the other night, uh, we have a little note here that we must begin this uh, this uh, seance tonight with uh, with a recognition that Jersey is at it. Of course, the the nutty state. You know that the that the state flower of the Jersey is the flowering nutmeg, which uh, kind of fits with Route Nine. Uh, the, the, uh, the 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 shadow of the Leaning Tower of Pizza as it falls so beautifully over the Pat Boone hamburger heaven. That uh, in conjunction with the Carvel ice cream. Uh, you know, the whole thing all comes together in a kind of a nice... It's, it's, uh, door, I'm not laughing. No, no. This is my world, friend. No, no. I believe in instant seat covers. Uh, I, I seriously do. Every, and every time I pass a Mr. Donut stand, I have to fight myself. I mean, you don't see David Niven having that problem. I'm sure that uh, Lawrence Olivier does not find himself standing in line in front of the Dairy Queen. Uh, and deciding whether or not he's going to get chocolate jimmies as a big decision for the night. But uh, we would like to salute Jersey tonight. Would you please bring me a little... Uh, that's it. Very good. Ever upward and ever onward. Oh, Jersey, Jersey, we love, we love you for everything, everything you do. Oh, Jersey, Jersey, oh, how... Admire thee as you sit out there and just sweat and sweat. Jersey, Jersey. Oh, wait a minute. Hold it. That's enough. Reset that, Keith. That's enough. We don't want to give him too much. Now, the only reason I'm bringing this up here tonight is we had a note here from Tuckerton, New Jersey. Um, and uh, contrary to popular opinion, there is a Tuckerton, New Jersey. This is not, this is not a cheap joke. Tuckerton, New Jersey, and, and people keep doing awful things with that name. They keep changing the lettering and everything on the signs out there. It's just awful. But uh, I mean, I'm just reporting. I'm not creating, you know. Why is it the reporter is always vilified for what he reports? I'm just telling you that in Tuckerton, New Jersey, uh, here a couple of days ago, they had a lost llama over there. Uh, you know what, a lama, I'm not talking about the kind of lama you know, that sits and meditates and contemplates the eye of Buddha. I'm talking about a lama lama, you know, that kind of walks around and spits in your eye. And uh, one of the reports that came back, uh, the first sighting of the animal whose natural habitat is Peru, was reported last Sunday morning. They've had a whole bunch of coil calls ever since then. Uh, this animal is about the size of a deer. Uh, he has long hair. And he's twice the size of a deer, actually, with the head of a camel. So if you see something like that out there, just, you know, don't don't worry. It's okay. Uh, he's uh, loose in uh, Tuckerton, New Jersey. And a report came from Waretown where a guy said he just saw the llama running through wet cement. And we repeat, honest, the caller told police, wet cement, the llama. He's running through the wet cement. There he goes. He's leaving footprints. He, oh, he wrecked my new sidewalk. And off he went into the woods. So uh, this is only in keeping with the surrealistic uh, world that we're all living in. Now, of course, you see, if, if I have always felt that if Walter Kerr saw a scene, a uh, stage play, for example, uh, down in the Armpit Theater, down in the village, we'll say, and uh, it, shows a, it shows a llama walking through a, a sidewalk of wet cement, 
and it's in a town in New Jersey, he would say the theater of the absurd is reaching. Is it? I don't know. I have never seen anything in the theater of the absurd that, any, that even remotely approaches what life is like. And uh, for that reason, I think we all need the theater, see, because it reassures us that there is continuity, and uh, there's good guys and bad guys, and everybody likes to identify. I, you know, for example, one of the great novels of all, you know, of the of the of the past uh, 25 years is uh, Catcher in the Rye and Holden Caulfield. In fact, I have a suspicion that every Holden Caulfield in the Western world listens to me. But uh, nevertheless, uh, everybody reading Catcher in the Rye, see, Holden Caulfield is this fantastic phony spotter. See, he walks around spotting phonies. Absolutely, his eye is 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 uh, impeccable. He has an eye that never fails to spot a phony from him. Or from just the slightest twitch of the eyebrow, the pony he knows. Well, now uh, he's also pure and in spirit. That's one thing you got to realize about Holden. He's very pure. He's beautiful, and uh, we have to take his word for it because he tells us this. He's a very beautiful person, very sensitive. Now, uh, the thing about reading Catcher in the Rye is that everybody identifies with Holden. They never identify with the phonies. Now, that's a very important. Even if the guy is a phony sitting there smoking a big fat cigar, and uh, he's saying, yes, indeed, of course. The, the point being here that we always, this is why we love the theater, because we identify with this. And this is why we love sports. Have you noticed the, the, the current cuckoo-ness now that's going on with the Mets? Listen, I was out at the Mets. I was out at the Mets when the only thing you could identify with was Marv Thornberry trying to run out a drag bunt with all three feet going at once. Now, the point is here, now suddenly everybody's out there. They're flipping, yelling, and hollering. Why? Because the Mets are winning. We identify with winners. We abhor losers. Well, why, why do, even losers, by the way. Nobody hates a loser worse than a loser. That's why the Met fans are out there by the millions cheering for, you know, the winners. Because most of them are losers, see. They, they, uh, it takes a certain amount of on-topness, seriously. A certain amount of basic inner winningness to appreciate a loser. I'll let that marinate for a minute. That's right. I mean, have you ever seen how cool the Yankee fans are sitting out there? The Yankees are losing because they know deep down inside, even when they lose, they're winners. You know, there are certain kind of losers that are winners even when they lose. Do you agree with that? Oh, you don't know about that? Well, let's put it this way. England has lost an empire, hasn't it? And yet, there is not a country in the world that does not shake inwardly when an Englishman comes over the horizon. Somehow, it's the home office. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Have you ever seen one English actor get a bad review in America? I sat through an entire play one night over at the Lunt Fontaine and did not hear three words, and I was in the fourth row. This English actor was so bad, he was also bagged to the ears, and he kept falling into the orchestra pit all night. And the next day, the review came out in the Times of Transcendental Theatrical Experience. Last night, it's the old Vic once again. What the hell am I watching? Well, I was watching tradition. I was watching, I was watching what it is, you see. And, uh, you can't beat it. Impossible. So if you guys, you know, all you guys out there that think that uh, by dint of, uh, you know, a couple of laws and getting the right jerseys, you're all of a sudden going to be, you know, you're going to be making it. Forget it. Oh, no. And so this is very important to remember. Now, where did I learn this? Well, what what is the date? Well, I'll tell you what happened to me, personally. Uh, I'm sitting around, you know, and I'm contemplating uh, my navel, as I often do. And i got a very nice navel, by the way. I like to look at it. And I'm sitting there contemplating my navel and, and uh, you know, concentrating and mulling over deep thoughts. And, and uh, I, I, once in a while, I like to come up with a concept. There's nothing like a good concept, especially a couple hours before dinner, and it can digest, and and uh, I bring up concepts. What's one? The air conditioning unit is going, and the and the papers are blown around in the office. And once in a while, four or five hundred memos come floating down from 
the great memo god that comes drifting in. They, they're blue. If you noticed, almost all memos, no matter where you work, are blue. We get these blue ones. They come drifting down, see? And uh, did you know that I know one guy here at the station? I better not tell anybody this, but because you know, I know at the station they won't hear this, so it's all right. Uh, no, they're, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Why, right now, our telephone operator is deeply involved in a program on Channel 2. She's sitting there watching that. And uh, and I can assure you, my engineer right now is reading a Lafayette radio catalog. And uh, every salesman who works for the station is sitting on the fan tail of his big, fat establishment yacht somewhere off uh, one of the Hamptons. So we had this little thing ourselves here. We can talk over this thing without any problems. Well, I know a guy for the last six months who has been handing out executive memos signing the name of a non-existent executive here at WOR. <laughs> and what's worse, all the other executives are acting on it. <laughs> so you, you, have to pick a, you have to pick a name that, that's conceivably an executive. Like C.J. Maston. And then you put a little parenthesis on it and just say C.J. And then you, you invent a department, you see, a department that sounds official as hell, like, uh, like, uh, oh, uh, something like, uh, surplus goods tabulating. Now, you don't argue with a department like that. Nobody ever goes to it. But boy, it sounds like it's official. Or, uh, say, for example, uh, cross-file tabulating. That's a good one. I got one the other day from that department. And it turned out one of the engineers was sending them around and, uh, and so you can, you can stir up a little action that way, you see. Uh, but you always basically remain a loser because what you're doing, you see, it's, it's like, it's like sailing paper airplanes out the window. You ain't flying a jet. That's all there is to it. Now you kid yourself, you know, but you're really not. And so, uh, I, I, uh, sitting here, you know, looking around at my office and I see this pile of crud growing higher and higher and uh, I'm knee deep in memos and, and I'm sitting here contemplating the bust of Aristotle. And uh, I like to contemplate the bust of Aristotle. He doesn't have much of a bust, but uh, it's the best I can do in the office late at night. Or the steno pool is closed, you know. And I'm sitting there contemplating the bust of Aristotle, and, and uh, it's a kind of a bad look at brass one too, which is where brass bust is nothing, you know. So I'm sitting there contemplating this and playing my Jew's harp, and so I decided to bring to you a. Uh, a tale. Now I must, must warn you: if you if you identify with winners, you're in for a bad night tonight. Because I'm going to bring to you a tale of true woe. Now, have you noticed? Have you noticed that the official guys, I, the official guys on television, never refer to their past life. They never do. You you would never know what Johnny Carson did before Johnny Carson became Johnny. Car he never tells you about working in the Esso station. Never. Because the minute he lets you know that he did, well then, there's all kinds of things begin to happen. Because the float in other, it's a kind of, it's a kind of vague feeling of, uh, of distrust. I mean, uh, there but for the grace of a good agent goes I. You don't want to feel that about the people you admire. You don't want to feel that the, you know, you really don't. You don't want to know that God once worked at the A&P. You know, working down there with those little rubber stampers stamping 49 cents on cans of sardines, you don't want to hear that, do you? Of course not. You don't, you, you, you don't want to know that at one time Merv Griffin weighed 267 pounds, which he did, and sang with one of the worst bands in the Midwest, earned his living by whistling the second chorus. You know, you don't want to know these things, do you? You don't want to know that the, that the jet pilot who was flying the 707 that you are now Riding in, at one time, worked changing tires down at the Shell station and constantly got his fingers stuck in the tires when he tried to take the tire iron out, do you? You don't want to know that. No. No background. That's what we need. We need a world where everybody's past is automatically and instantaneously erased. So that every minute of the day, you are reborn a new and pristine individual. Ready to do battle with this new husk that you have been uh, blessed with. You see, then by the way, that's the one thing you can't do anything about. Is your corporeal you. You can't do anything about the fact that you're three feet nine and weigh 280 pounds. 
Now, <laughs> you know, you can do all you want about... So what you do is generally become a, a, a reader, you see, or you become an observer of Joe Namath. You, uh, yeah, the, the, the more impossible you find it to do things yourself, the more you tend to identify with those who can. You sit out there and you cheer Namath. There are more 122-pound weaklings out there cheering Namath every week than you ever saw in your life. You know, Namath, he, you know, he just shakes them off like fleas, you know, like a, like a dog shaking off flies, you know. Well, I'm going to tell you a true story. Everybody has a secret feeling that it can be, it can be embodied in one human expression that is in every language that I have ever been in. I have, I have been all over the world about a dozen times. And every place I've gone, they have one expression. It's the only universal expression, Keith, that I've seen everywhere. And I'm sure that you had one down there in the islands that, that was the same. You never can tell. Now, that is an expression I've heard in every damn language. I've heard. Everybody's got an expression that means... Like, it's a kind of a fatalistic shrug. Any minute now, the world is going to open up and suck you right down into the guts. That's it. You never can tell. Well, how do we get like this? It's a good question. Well... You see, the thing about getting that way is that you've had to have been sucked down into the guts of the earth a couple of times and then spewed back up, bobbing like a cork on the Sargasso Sea of Existence. After a couple of, you know, little trips through the maelstrom, you no longer, you know, entirely believe that the ship is unsinkable. You prone to doubt the signs you know, the signs that come on every piece of equipment you get, the appliances that say shockproof, or the ones that says tested by the laboratory, or a 90-day guarantee, or you will be satisfied. You don't believe this stuff deeply down inside of you. When you go in and you look at a commercial scene, the commercial says, uh, you know, that. have you noticed that every enzyme cleaner is better than every other enzyme cleaner? Somehow it seems to me there's a basic fallacy there. But I am not about to pursue that metaphysical idea tonight. Not on Saturday night. There was a time when my hopes were bright. When I viewed the world as a vast, unbelievably succulent taffy apple. All I had to do was grab a hold of the stick and start chomping. So, I viewed the world as a place where guys won. If they were pure in heart, if they did their push-ups, if they, uh, you know, stuck with it, okay? I believe this firmly, without question. And one summer in my sophomore year in high school, after playing football in my freshman year, and playing, incidentally, on a team which went undefeated, for 14 consecutive games, right? I have now been called out for fall practice. It was in August. The temperature was 115 degrees. And me and 100 guys gathered on the football field, remember, among which were the undefeated freshman team, the sun is beating down, and we started to do push-ups. Then we did rockers. Now, do you know how the rocker works? The rocking chair, that is a you-know-what buster. Yes, <laughs> indeed. And, uh, yeah, you used to do that for well, about an hour and a half, man. And I'll tell you, either you will have a stomach that is made out of solid cast iron, or you'll be dead. There's no in-between. And I was all around me. I saw the dead bodies. Yeah. And I get up, you know, and I'm aching from one end of my body to the other. Then we did this one. How about the squat? Do you like that one? That's a goodie. You just keep squatting, and your knees are banging away and clicking and rattling like castanets. You know how your knee cracks? Well, you ought to try that for an hour, just squatting up and down in the sun, just squatting. They go, one, two, squat, one, two, squat, one, two, squat. And every time you go down, your left knee goes, one, two, squat, one, two, squat. Well, after a while, it gets you in the calf of the leg, it gets you in your behind, it gets you up in the back of your neck. 
Then you get up and the guy says, oh, no, you guys, we're going to do push-ups for the next 20 minutes. I don't want no guy out here to do less than 100 push-ups. All right, let's go straighten up that back and put that butt down. All right, here we go. One, two. You start the push-ups. All right, this is done for four and a half hours. And then after two weeks of that, you feel like you are as solid, man, as a bowling ball. You are hard as a rock. Then you start scrimmaging. First, gradual. And then at the end of the third week, the big cut comes. The coach says, this is it, men. The first game will be next week. And uh, it's been a pleasure working all you guys. As you know, some guys don't make it, other guys do. And this is not saying nothing about you guys that didn't make it. You guys who didn't make it, don't forget that it ain't the way you win the game. It's, well, you know how you play it. You guys were out here. You put out for everything you had. We want to tell you we admire all of you, but please get off the field and let the men play. And so then they hand out the suits. That's a terrible moment after you've busted your you-know-whats, you know, <laughs> and you've sweated down, and the next thing you know, you're down the chute, you're discarded. You're down there, you know, with the girls and the guys that are playing in the clarinet section in the band. And now, what is left? All right, 33 Iron Men. Right? Okay, right. And so for that solid week, we scrimmaged against one another, and we were fantastic. We were really great. We would scrimmage on offense. We would scrimmage on defense. And Shepard is down there, you know, playing, <laughs> playing on the defensive backfield. It's working groovy, you know. Back and forth we go. Every play was like clockwork, precision. I remember the coach would say, All right, you guys, we want to do 32. Yellow, 32 yellow. Let's see that, move that ball, and let's get the snap into it. And I don't want to see none of you guys telegraphing it. 32 yellow. And we'd say, 32 yellow, okay. One, two, five, zowie. Everything's great. You got it? And then the day dawned. Bright and early. It was a Saturday, just like any other Saturday, except for one thing. It was the day of Armageddon. And that, you know, speaking of Armageddon, this is W-O-R, friends. Yes, sir. And you can spell it any way you care to. Some guys put an H in it, some don't. This is W-O-R, and we're in New York. The classic tour of Europe. The Grand Tour. To London with its palaces and pubs. To Paris, City of Light and the eternal city of Rome. Now you can take the Grand Tour with Pontus. Fly Qantas on a tour that treats you better all around. From New York, $662 for 21 days of Europe, complete with guides. The Grand Tour. See your travel agent and fly Australia's round-the-world airline. Fly Qantas! And it was the it was it was a beautiful Saturday, you know, it was a fall Saturday. And I woke up, and I for now about a month, see, I've been aching in my bones, and I've been playing. I and I have been issued a suit. You are listening, friends, to number 65. Great big white 65 on the back of a purple jersey. That was for our home games. For our away games, I had a great big purple 65 on the back of my white jersey. Got it? Had this great big white helmet. Beautiful, you know, just like Joe's got, see? And it had 65 on the side of it. Great big nose guard hanging out in front there. Impregnable shepherd, right? Had a set of shoulder guards, man, that fit me, I'll tell you. Just to, you know, like I dreamed, I went out naked one night without my shoulder guards on. That kind of thing just hung on there, groovy. I got a pair of these tight silk pants, you know, the stretch pants so tight, you just touch them and they go thlung. Oh, man. Spike shoes, the works. All right. I woke up about 10 o'clock Saturday, you know, no school today type thing. 
sun is streaming in. Kind of brisk, little touch in the air, little fall tinge there. You know, the, the, the little fall tinge you've been feeling recently that is making the sap move. More than one guy now is reaching into his closet again saying, you know, Charlie, I think I'll get to work on that novel that I've been working on. Every third guy's working on a novel. Every fourth guy's working on a musical. Every fifth guy is working on a TV series. And every, I'd say every other guy has got a film that he's working on. And in between, there's millions of guys who are going to learn to play the guitar. But, uh, you know, everybody's got this thing. And so I wake up, gee, beautiful day. And uh, I sit on the edge of the bed. What? Suddenly hit me. This is it. This is the day. Gee. I get up. Walk into the kitchen. My mother's hanging over the sink. Got the Brillo pad. She's got on her chenille bathrobe. Everything's cool. My kid brother's sitting there at the kitchen table whining. I walk in. Number 65 has come in for his morning proteins. Number 65. I sit down at the kitchen table at one of these white enamel kitchen tables. You know, I sit down there in my T-shirt. I sit there, what's for breakfast? And she says, oatmeal. I said, oatmeal. She said, oatmeal. Either that or go to the store. The day was starting downhill, although I did not know it, you see, at the time. I said, okay. I'll have the oatmeal. So I knocked down the oatmeal, had a little uh, little coffee there, you know, some uh, marshmallows, my usual breakfast, you know. I ate some Mary Janes. I then went around, I then walked around the house, and I had to, you know, feeling my kid brother's following me because he was always buds because I had these shoulder pads. So uh, I went to the bedroom there and got dressed, and it was the day. Two o'clock that afternoon. I am on my way to the school. It is the day of our first game. The first day on the varsity. You hear that? Exciting moment. You never hear athletes talk about it. This is exactly the way you get all excited. See? So I'm on the bus, going on to school. Now, the game was not until 7 o'clock that night, friends. So I gathered down here. We went down to the gym. We had been instructed to get down there about 2 o'clock and do a little, you know, a little, a little skull work, a little uh, chalk work, and a little stuff like that. So we gather in the gym in our, you know, just wearing our T-shirts, stuff like that. Guys wearing nothing but the jockey shorts and stuff. We sit around. And a coach is up there at the, at the big blackboard that came down out of the ceiling. So he's walking around. He's got the lights on. He's got a pointer. All right, you guys. It's the day now. I want one thing for you guys to remember. You're winners. You're winners. That's all you got to know in this game. You're winners. You played a ball club that last year won three games out of 12. Now, on the other hand, I don't want any of you guys to sit down and figure you're just going to run over these guys, right? Right. Keep it in mind. You are a winner. Now, and by the way, this coach had been a three-time All-American, so he knew what he was talking about. He was a winner. Now, let us say now that we are receiving a kickoff. Now, I want you to watch this diagram, and I wanna, I'm going to ask you some questions. Now, we are receiving a kickoff. The ball player that is kicking off, we all know him. His name is Johnny Horska. Johnny Husk has been playing on the Washington Oilers now for two years. He ain't never kicked the ball over 30 yards in his life. We've been watching Johnny. He is kicking off. All right, now the chances are that the first or the second line of kickoff returners is going to get that ball. This is not going to be for the safety men, right? Okay, now. The ball is kicked now down the right sidelines. They are moving up towards you. Who is going to cover the ball carrier? Which ones? Now put your hands up. All right. Okay, now we're underway. Now, let us say we now got the ball on the 48-yard line. We have returned the ball to the 48-yard line. Okay, now this is the first play of the game. What are we going to do with the first play of the game? Okay, our papers tell us. This is our quarterback, our ace quarterback. 
in the big hung jaw, you know, later on went to Alabama. All right, Papers, what are you going to do in that first play? Uh, going to call 32 yellow. All right, 32 yellow. That's right. Now we got the ball down on the 50. We've met past the midstream line. We're now on the 45-yard line of the other team, right? Now, what are we calling the second play now? We know. Who, who are we playing? I think we're playing. What kind of a pass defense have it got now, Papers? Uh, 44 green. All right. All right. Now, we are now within striking distance. We are on the 12-yard line. Now, what are we doing? All right. Let's keep that ball on the ground for the next three plays. And we now have a touchdown. Score is now 7 up. You, Kyle, of course, will kick the extra point. The game is now seven minutes old. Now, we are about to kick off. And so all afternoon, we're sitting there. Just beautiful. We played that ball game every last second of that game, right? Every second. By the way, the game wound up 37-6. to six. We were total victors. It is now six o'clock in the evening. And so with that, they set up the tables. And the coach says, now I want you guys to eat very late before the game. We brought in some stuff for you guys to eat with a little salad, maybe some orange juice, a couple of hamburgers, and that's all. I don't want none of this stuff. We're going to take it easy. We're going to keep them guts flat. And we're going to move tonight. One thing we're going to do, move, 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 always move, move. We want you to go after them, after them, move. Ah, oh, boy, we're getting up there, see. You can see our teeth flash. Ah, angry. So we're eating the hamburgers, you know, and I'm hitting a couple of guys, and they're hitting me, and I get out of the way, and we're getting bugged. That, that tremendous, that, that great well stream of aggressive humanity is beginning to flow up like a, like a, like an exploding volcano inside of each one of us. Guys are getting caught, and you can see these angry, slit eyes beginning to develop. You can see canine teeth hanging down over lower lips. Ah, guys are biting. And now we start suiting up. That's always a groovy moment, you know. You go in, into the dressing room, start putting on the suits. And Shepard is getting all suited up, you know. The guy comes up and down. We had this guy, Mr. Wilson, who was the trainer. And he's walking up and down. He said, all right, now I want all you guys to make sure you got the tape. Uh, put on the tape and pull it tight. Let me, let me check your tape. Tape on the knuckles, you know. We got the tape on the elbows. and We got tape all over the knees and all that. Putting on the shin guards, putting everything on, you know, pulling all up, getting these pads up, cool and tight. And then finally, that's, 6.35, I stand up in front of my locker. Big number, 65. Ready to go. And the guy with the next locker to me was number 67, who, by the way, later went on to play for the Washington Redskins, in case you're interested. He was about 6 feet 9, weighed 280 pounds. He spoke no known language. He was totally inchoate. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All we knew is that his name was Al, the big Al. And Al would get up there, and he just breathed all the time. And he breathed through his mouth. You'd hear him breathe. He was like a rhinoceros. And Al was standing next to me, and he'd sweat. He'd just sweat. And you could see the hair growing out of it from the back of his neck. It's growing out to his uniform. It's like a big Al. And there we are. And the coach now stands up on one of the benches in the in the dressing room. You know, these benches well. He gets up and he says, all right now, men, we're not going out on the field for the first time for the season. There's 20,000 people out there, and they want to see you win. They're not here to see you do nothing else. They want you to win. The other team don't want you to win. Them guys are keeping away victory from you. They are taking victory right out of your mouth. Do you want them guys to take what is rightfully yours away? That's right. A bunch of thugs. These guys don't deserve to be on the same field with you, right? All right, now let's go. When I give the sign, open that door, and we want to charge out on that field. All right, let's go, ma'am. Hooray! We yell. The whole crowd goes running out. And the band is out there playing. You can hear them playing. 
They're marching around the field. You can see the band marching up and down the field. It is the pregame. The pregame ceremonies are about to begin. And the ball club now runs out of the field. 20,000 people. Ah! Fantastic roar of the lights. It's a night ball game. We see way down at the other end of the field. These guys in these white uniforms with the green hats. Those thugs that are going to take the rightful, the rightful victory away from us, okay? We run out and we fan out instantly. Defensive team fans out. Offensive team fans out. Kickoff team is now moving around up the center. The balls are tossed back and forth and we get down into our offensive lineup. All right, let's try. Let's run some 32 right, huh? 32 yellow. Okay, here we go. Ha, ha, hey, ha, 32 yellow. Ha, ha, ha. We move forward. The crowd. Ah! The back of me, Kyle is kicking a ball. You know, I can hear our ace kicker. Kadook. 40 yards, 50 yards, 70 yards. That ball is sailing down the field. Then I see our ace pass catcher. Our, our fantastic end is going down. Al Bergoglio is drifting down. And he grabs a pass. A 75-yard pass from Papers. And we see those little figures down there in the white jerseys. The green helmets. The cheerleaders are flipping, going upside down and yelling and hollering. The band is playing again. Hey, we're up! And this is the start of another fantastic season. The victors have arrived. It's a little like uh, Napoleon and his marshal arriving before the gates of Moscow with the band's playing. <laughs> joy. And the band marched off the field, making a gigantic block H. The silver batons flashed high in the, in the starlight. You can see all those little cheerleader chicks flying up and down. Their little old bottoms are bouncing up in the air. Now we're ready for the ball game. Our team gathers down around the 10-yard line. The coaches are at men's. Here's the starting lineup. And he reads the lineup. In case we receive, here is the starting lineup for receiving a kickoff. He reads the lineup. Here is the starting lineup in case we are kicking off. He reads that lineup. All right, men, let's get ready to play ball. And here we go. Ah! We give another yell. We all grab our hands. You know that bit where everybody grabs the hands? And we go run towards the bench, and we see the captain of our ball club and one of the big tackles from last year. They're out there at the 50-yard line, and now they are flipping for the for the kickoff return or the kickoff kickoff. The coin goes into the air, drops down into the ground. I see the referee go down on his knees looking for it. They can't find the dime. It's down in the grass. They crawl around. It's a little bit of argument. And then one of the trainers runs out and gives him another dime. They flip the dime up. Little did we realize this was an omen. That dime, by the way, belonged to our coach. It was his lucky dime. They flip the dime up. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then I see the signal. The other captain has got the kickoff. He has won the he has won the toss, and they have elected to kick off. Completely confounding us. He points down like that. They had a win, see? He points down like that. They trot down. That means I'm out on the ball field. And so Shepard trots out into the second line of receivers, you know, looking around. First big game. The varsity. I look back, and I can see papers. I see a couple of other guys stretching, moving, you know, back and forth we go. And I can see that line of, that line of kickers down there, that line... Of the kickoff team moving into position down there. I see that big kickoff man, that Johnny Ruska. He's about 19 feet tall, big, heavy set guy, you know. All he does is kick. We know he don't kick no more than 30 yards at a shot, you know. But he hit, he used to kick these hard, bouncing ground balls that would come slithering. They were built for, for picking up, you know. And he moves back. You can see the big pieces of tape that he's got on his knuckles. He moves back, he spits. And somewhere off in the somewhere off in the distance, the band began to play. See the pep song. You could hear them playing softly. See, here it goes. 
They're sweeping up. They get a half a teeth. You can hear the whole crowd curling off. You know, one, two, three, four, as he moves up the kick. And then, boom, that ball is in the air. 190 yards he kicked. The son of a gun kicked it over the end zone, into the stands. Well, we have not taken this play into account. We now got the ball on the 20-yard line. All set. Shepard is down in the... Shepard is down in position. All set now. At the papers is called place. All right, 32 yellow. You heard what the coach said. Let's give them 32 yellow to begin with, right? We'll probe their line. Looks like they're using a six-man line, all right? Okay, men's now let's get it moving. Let's move it. All right. Hop, hoop, hee, hop. We're now back on the 14-yard line. What are we going to do? I could see Huffa, the coach, is pacing up and down back of him. I look over, and already I got this funny bump on my my arm. It's on my right my right wrist. Somebody stepped on it. And I see Papers, his face is kind of red. He says, I don't think you what. Let's try. 44 green. 44 green. Hook pass. 44 green. Now look. You guys cover. 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 44 green. All right, let's go. Move, move. I see the ball in the air. I'm hitting the gut. The next thing I know, they are over for the touchdown. A little skinny guy grabbed the ball, ran right down the sidelines, and they're over. I get up, and I've got a bloody nose. I don't know how it happened. i got a bloody nose. We're behind six to nothing. The ball game is two and a half minutes old. You see the big six up there. And I can hear their band start to play off in the distance. I hear another band, you know. It ain't our band. They're starting to play. I can hear them playing. Come on, let's hear them play, man. Play it. I can hear them. They are lining up for the extra point. Paper says, now look, we've got to block this point. I mean, get, remember who this is. This is the Washington Oilers. These are nothing. These guys are nothing. And he's starting to cry. We line up and zap between the goalposts. All right, at least we're going to kick this time. I am out of the ball game for the kick, right? So I'm sitting on the bench. And all the rest of the guys are sitting there looking at real quiet. See, behind us is the is the cheering section. And now our kickers are ready. Kyle is up there to kick. Well, we know that Kyle, he can kick a ball 150 yards. I mean, in his sleep. They move up to the line of scrimmage. The ball rolls about 18 feet. Somebody picks it up. Runs it back to the 50, he's down to the 45-yard line, he's down to the 40, he's down to the, and he's nailed at the 28-yard line. They're on a 28-yard line, our 28-yard line. Dead silence on the bench. The game is now eight minutes old. We see the Washington Oilers lining up. We see our stout defensive team now get into position. With the future All-American guard, who later went for the Washington Redskins, he is calling the defensive signals. They are down now. In the, you hear the signal? They move through the center of the line for eight yards. They're now down at the 20-yard line. Well, I don't have to tell you, friends. At the end of the first quarter, the score was 17 to nothing. At the end of the half, the score was 26 to 2. We scored a safety. Shepard goes in at the beginning of the third period, waiting for the kickoff. The band is playing again. They are lining up. Zap! I see that ball going up in the air. I lose it in the lights. All of a sudden, somebody next to me hollers, Shepard, grab it, grab it, it's coming down. I look around, coming down, what do you mean, coming down? I see it come off the last second, I see it coming out of the lights. I make a grab for it. It hits me on the chest, it goes up in the air again. I grab it again. I start to move forward, and 17 guys hit me. Pow! That was the end of the quarter for me. Well, the third quarter went even worse. We were trailing 49-2 to two at the end of the third quarter, and it was obvious what was happening. What wasn't obvious to the fans was what was happening in the huddles. 
It's a very different atmosphere. Very different. I remember halfway in the third quarter, we are down on possibly our own 17-yard line. The last four plays have netted us a minus 16 yards. Papist, our, our ace quarterback, his eyes are streaming. He's crying. He says, what are we going to do? What do you want? What do you, you guys got any ideas? What play do you want? What do you want? To, any ideas? Come on, Al, for God's sakes, you got any ideas? And Al says, kick. Yeah, yeah, let's kick. Let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of it. And so up into the, up into the formation, you, you don't see this from the stands. And we go charging up. And I remember Kyle going back to kick. And that line comes through like butter. They come through and I'm trying to block. And I see Kyle with the last instant. His foot goes up. The kick is blocked. It goes high in the air. It's coming down to me again. Down it comes. Whap! That was the end of the ball game for another eight minutes for me. And the last minute we played out, it started to rain. The rain is coming down in sheets. The score is 63 to 9. The rain is pouring down in sheets. And the band started to play. By now, three quarters of the fans have left. You could see them just streaming out of the stadium. You could see the buses moving out. And we are playing out that last minute of the ball game. That last minute it happened. That last miserable damn minute it actually happened. We are back on the 12-yard line. Papis is down in the huddle. He says, 44 green. For the last time, you idiots, 44 green. Remember to play. Do the play like we did in, in practice. 44 green. Green, don't you remember? And I remember going up into the up in a position, and I could see 44 green all of a sudden in my mind on the blackboard. I could see it. 4-4-G, and I could see all the little lines, and the red arrows, and the blue arrows, and the yellow arrows, and mine one, my little line, which was a purple arrow. I saw my purple arrow. See? So I saw 44 green. I'm down in the line. Hup, hup, three, four, four, green, hup, two. The ball is next. The play was unbelievable. Like clockwork. We scored from the 12-yard line. Zap. And the Washington Oilers stood for a second. Just look. We scored from the 12-yard line. As we trotted up the kick to that extra point, paper said, We booted it. We could have done that all night, you idiots. We booted it. We booted it. With that, Kyle kicked the extra point. And the gun went off. The ball game was over. We lost the first game, 63, friends. I repeat, 63. I ask you to think of the score, to 15. This was the ball club that we had beaten the year before, 49 to nothing. And in the rain, we trotted back into the dressing room. The rain is coming down. Oh, it's coming down so hard. My uniform is soaked and torn. And I had a cut on my my wrist, which incidentally I still bear the scar from. I have a lump under one eye. I have a rib, which still hurts me sometimes when I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Where a guard caught me with his knee. And we trooped into the dressing room. I remember the coach not saying anything. doesn't say anything. He's got a clipboard. He's sitting at his desk. We come trooping in. We sit down. Every one of us. I open my lock. My uniform is all dirty and cruddy. That beautiful brand new number 65, which I was so proud of. And Big Al is sitting next to me. I mean, as much as he ever sat. Al sort of squatted, you know sitting next to me. He goes, <sighs> Al, by the way, was the only one that played football that night. Al, who was, was a one-man line. 
Al, who had made something like 74 tackles. Al, who had blocked three kicks, intercepted two passes. Later, a star for the Washington Redskins. He just sat there with those two little BBs that he used for eyes, those two little red BBs. He didn't care whether we won or lost. He hit a lot of guys, that's all. I got up. I walked across the room. The heat was coming out of the showers. And my knee was beginning to swell. The coach got up on the seat finally with his clipboard. We said nothing. We just sat there. The smell of sweat. The smell of defeat. Do you know that defeat has a smell? I'll tell you, friends, the adrenaline works very different when you're scared and losing than when you're winning. And that's what makes the smell. You walk into the Mets dressing room after they won a doubleheader against the Cubs, and it smells like the sweet elixir of paradise. You walk into there after they've lost three straight to Pittsburgh, and there's a strange jungle, a, 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 a smell of lost and gone and dead things. And that was the first time that I'm smelling that smell. And the coach now stands up. He's wearing his, he's wearing his civilian suit. He's wearing, no, no, the theme up. He's wearing his civilian suit. When I point that means the machine. He's wearing a civilian suit. He's got a clipboard. And I remember trying to stop the blood as it's running out of my nose as he's talking. I had this great big wad of Kleenexes that some of the guys had handed me. Just a big wad, and I'm holding it like this, and I can taste the blood. It's running down. I've got a cut lip that comes down from the left nostril almost all the way down to the mouth itself. It's cut. My tooth has gone through it. You ever try that, friends, on a good, quiet Saturday night? It sure kills your social life. Tell you that. I'm sitting there with this Kleenex with the blood dripping into it. And Al is sitting next to me, sweating. He's sitting there like King Kong after a nice afternoon on the Empire State Building. And the coach says, didn't say much, actually. We expected to yell. It's all right. You did it. You did it, right? He holds up the clipboard. So I had here in his clipboard every last mistake what you made tonight. You notice I ain't got no more room for paper? I'm going to thin this clipboard out. I'm going to tell you another thing. If we pull this again next week, we're going to have a lot of new guys sitting in this dressing room. The next week, we lost 49 to 12.